Welcome to Moe's! If you've never tried the stacks at Moe's, it's like a roller coaster. Filled with two crispy tortillas, you realize something big is approaching. And that moment hits when all-natural chicken is added along with Moe's famous queso, fresh veggies, and all-natural shredded cheese. At which point, it's all folded and grilled crispy, flipping your world upside down. So hurry into Moe's Southwest Grill today for the stacks and enjoy the ride of a lifetime. football across North Jersey. This is season three, episode one. I am Corey Doviak, and I'm excited. It's football time again. It's been a long, hot summer. Not much action going on on NorthJerseySports.com, a soccer camp, a track and field camp. But the big time has returned. Football has broken out across the state, and the same crew will be with you all year to go over the action as it happens. I am happy to welcome in for the second straight year. We finally got some stability on this program. My co-hosts, one, Brandon Gregory. How you doing, pal? What's going on, buddy? How are you, Corey? I'm doing great. I, ha- I had a great time with you watching the Pascac Valley versus Hackensack game. A great game to kick things off on an old-school Saturday afternoon uh, public school, high school football game. It was great, and what made it even more exciting was the fact that we got to spend the day also with our other co host the, I don't know, Jimmy, i got to come up with some type. Mr. Football might be, maybe how about this, Jimmy Football. Jimmy Avitabile, Jim, what's going on, pal? How's it going, Corey? Another great year coming up. I can feel it. It is a great year, and it already is a great year. You know, this, uh, well, let me, let, let's set this up. This is going to be a great show, first of all. Right out of the box, Season 3, Episode 1, we're going to have some great guests, starting with, Northern Valley Old Japan senior Jordan Fuller, one of the most coveted recruits, not only uh, in the state of New Jersey, but also across the country. So he will be our first guest of the season. Then we're going to bring in our friend Pat Rice, uh, who really basically knows everything about football across the state of New Jersey. So we're going to use him as a preview slash review guide because uh, preview week one is next week, but review because zero week was this past week. We can't do a preview show because too much has already happened. And we'll get into some of this later because we have sound from games across North Jersey, including the Pascac Valley game that we did. We also have some interviews from a game that we'll get into deeper with Pat Rice. But, Jimmy, a lot has already been decided. In the Well, I, I shouldn't say been decided, but some interesting shots across the bow in zero week in the Big North, uh, especially in that parochial division. Uh, no question, Corey. You talk about Primus Catholic, the unanimous number one team in the in the state of New Jersey, number one in the area, obviously. You know, top 15 to 20 in the country. They take on an Easter Christian team from Maryland, who they beat convincingly last last year, and it did not work the Paladin way. They got they got totally dominated. They were beaten 42 to 20, and I'm sure there's a lot of head scratching going on at Primus Road. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, where probably you will be on Tuesday morning, and uh, take some notes is all I can ask you to do. Uh, and also, the St. Joseph Regional beating Don Bosco Prep. You know, Brandon, that game got moved up this year because of the way schedule's shaking out, because public schools finally got their uh, clean break from parochial schools on their schedule. The parochials had to, you know, scramble a little bit to fill some holes, and that moved St. Joe's and Don Bosco to zero week. St. Joe's wins, and there is a decided favorite now, even though, uh, you know, Bergen Catholic also won, but there is a decided favorite now in the uh, Big, North, Big North United. Yeah, as usual, you know, Catholic football up in northern New Jersey area is always a big thing. Uh, obviously, this weekend with the uh, two two of the three, big three, playing a, a out-of-state opponent, like Jimmy had mentioned, and then the loss of Bosco to St. Joe's. So hopefully as things progress during the course of the year, We'll see some good, high-quality um, play in, within that division. So, you know, we'll see. It's still early, like you said. It's zero week. It's called zero week for a reason. <laughs> and then hopefully um, there's more There's more good things to come. Week one, we'll have a first full slate. I'm really – and actually, to be honest with you, Corey and Jimmy, I'm really excited behind that because it was good spending some time with Jimmy uh, yes, uh, Friday night and Saturday along with you on Saturday, Corey. So that, that's always a good experience for me, and I appreciate that. 
Yeah, and you guys got in, you got, had, I didn't even mention, the great one, uh, the Battle of Midland Ave, as it was called, as Riverdale and Paramus went 15-14 on Friday night, basically, to open the season with a bang. We'll talk about that more. We'll bring on Pat Rice. But before we do that, this is a very exciting moment here on Season 3, Episode 1 of the Monday Morning Quarterback, because we have our first guest of the year, and it is a good one, as we welcome in Northern Valley Old Tapan High School senior Jordan Fuller. Jordan, thanks for joining us here no on problem. the Monday Morning Quarterback. Yeah. So, yeah, no listen, we're, yeah, we're going to start this interview uh, in very predictable fashion. I'm mm-hmm. going to ask you point blank, and then you're going to do what you do. So, Jordan Fuller, one of the uh, most coveted high school recruits in the United States of America, not only in New Jersey, where are you going to college? Um, <laughs> as of right now, I do not know. So, I'm really just taking my time with the whole process, just listen, listening to what uh, every school has to tell me and uh, how they want to use me and the overall vibe I get on campus and all that good stuff. So, I mean, I'm just taking my time with the process. I'll probably come in after the season sometime. You handled that like a pro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, all right, so now let's talk a little uh, Jordan Fuller and some Old Japan football. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of teams around here got underway this week. You guys didn't have that luxury. you got to wait another week. Yeah. How tough is it here when you go, you know, you see other teams playing and you guys still have, a what, another six days before you can kick things off here? Um, I mean, there's, I wish we played. But, I mean, I know it's probably good for us because we got a few more days of training camp in, just uh, getting our mental toughness and uh, just really gelling as a team. So I think it was beneficial for us. Yeah, but uh, we're ready for next week, definitely. Hey, Brandon, you think they need that little bit of extra training camp to get ready for Tannafly? Um, I plead the fifth on that. <laughs> yeah, don't answer that question. Go ahead, but ask Jordan one. Yes. Now, Jordan, we should, we should set up that your relationship with Jordan Fuller and the Fuller family goes deep. So ask him one of those hard-hitting questions that nobody else might know. Well, I, I'll, I'll leave some of that alone, too. And <laughs> I think we'll keep things basically on football uh, for, All right. for and Jimmy. But, Jordan, moving forward into your senior year, obviously there are high expectations um, with the team and so forth and so on. With so many seniors returning, I'm going to mention a few since I do know the kids pretty well. Obviously, Zach the Knight, John Pickenitz, the Pickenitz brother, John and Steven, Jed Downey, um, Kevin Martinez. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, how ha- how did camp go, like Corey mentioned, and uh, and how are you all handling the expectations? How is the coaching staff treating you, uh, Coach Dunn and the rest of the crew? Okay, well, camp went great. Um, it was a real tough camp. I'm, we uh, We've had some hot days, and then we were out there for uh, what seemed like endless hours, but I mean, we got a, a we got a lot tougher from that, and um, I mean, I know the paper has us rated as like number one, but like nobody has higher expectations for us than we do. So, I mean, and we don't really pay attention to that stuff to begin with. What I know is just it's just a fact. But uh, we we just care about our ranking at the end of the season rather than preseason because it doesn't really matter. We have something in common because we don't care about that paper either. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, J- Jimmy. Go ahead. Ask Jordan a question. Yeah, Jordan. In the last two years, you guys have gotten to the state semifinals. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. you guys did not advance to Giant Stadium. What yeah. do you think you have to do as a team to get to the next level? Really, just remain focused and uh, keep competing in practice. I know in past years we've kind of like once the starters were kind of figured out, we kind of just didn't compete as much in practice as we probably should have been. So this year we're really competing hard, like every drill, every rep we do. So I mean, I think that will be the difference, hopefully. How about how about for you personally? What are you trying to work on? You know, when I asked you about the, the college question, mm-hmm. you said, um, you know, you wanted to hear how coaches were going to use you. How do you see that happening, you know, on the high school level this, you know, last time around for you? How would you like to be used and – uh, you know, uh, what what are your expectations for your senior year personally? Well, the senior year, I just want to be anywhere that uh, I could be to help my team win the game. Say it, man. Say it. Say it. Just give me the ball. <laughs> no, not necessarily. I mean, I could block too. So, I mean, we, we've got great right. skill kids that could, that could take to the house too. So, I mean, we're pretty dangerous, I'd say. 
Yeah, and how important is that, too, because you know you're going to be the guy that's going to be keyed on. And, and like Brandon ran down the list of names uh, before, you do have mm-hmm. a lot of talented offensive players. So, sure. you know, taking the pressure off of each other, I think, is going to be big. Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah, we got a lot of guys that, that can really do some special things with the ball in their hands. Go ahead, Brent. Yes, Jordan. Um, since you're a high-profile athlete, how would, how difficult mm-hmm. was it for you to come and following behind your brother, obviously Devin, Devin, who's presently playing at UCLA. Mm-hmm. With expectations coming in your freshman year, dealing with all the other stuff, obviously everybody knowing that you had uh, a scholarship offer when you are in the eighth grade. How did that, going through that process, make you a senior athlete that you had? Um, well, I mean, I used to pay attention to that stuff, like probably like my freshman and sophomore years, but now it's just on my own hand. I don't really pay attention to all that, oh, he's better than his brother, he's not as good as his brother, but all that stuff. But um, he's just one of my biggest role models. I try to um, do things that he does. He's just a respectful guy. Everybody respects him and a great player on the field, too. So, I mean, I just want to be like that. Go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, Jordan, obviously being a, a highly recruited athlete as well, or as well as your brother, if you can just let the and, average, and, and, the average and fan. The dog, and the dog owner as well. Yeah, if you can let the average football fan into the recruiting world of how much a burden it is on you as far as during the week, how many phone calls, how many emails, how many, you know, tweets. If you can just let the average person know. Um, well, like, Twitter DMs, I get, I get DMs every day, probably from, like, um, on a, on a big day, it's probably, like, probably, like, 15 coaches, but on, like, a slower day, it's probably, like, around four or five. But then calls, I don't, I don't really do calls as much, probably around five calls a week, I'd say. So, yeah. Are you, do you enjoy it? Like when you get a DM from a big time Division One head coach, you're like, "Hey, that's cool," or or is it starting to get annoying at this point? No, it's always cool because I know um, not many kids uh, are in my position. So I mean, I never get like, "Oh, uh, stop, stop talking to me" or stuff like that because I, I know I'm, I'm pretty blessed to be in this position. That's a great answer right there. Mm-hmm. How much is uh, Devin doing any inter family recruiting? Uh, no, he's not. He, he's just watching to make my own decision. He doesn't tell you how nice the weather is out there in December and uh, the Rose Bowl. And... <laughs> of course he does. Of course he does. I mean, <laughs> he's just watching to make my own decision, not his decision. How cool is it watching him catch a touchdown pass yesterday? Oh, it was awesome. My whole family goes crazy whenever he, whenever he makes a big catch or something like that. So, I mean, yesterday was a great day. Great day. Good, Brent. Uh, last question, Jordan. Um, obviously, like you said, you know, Corey talking about your brother, Jimmy talking about the recruiting. What mm-hmm. what has been one of the better things that you've learned through all of this as far as what you, what you can expect from the college coaches and and how and how they treat you overall or how you've been how you've been I should say how you've been treated overall through this um ongoing process of you choosing uh, a college and with it um coming along with your senior year in high school? Um, well, I, I talked to my brother about this. He just says, um, just uh, keep it cool and uh, focus on my season, really, right now, and put uh, recruiting on the on the back burner a little bit. I mean, I'm still going to talk to coaches and stuff like that, but it's not really my main focus right now. I just want to get that state championship. I remember when you when Devin was a senior and he was going through this, too, and uh, they were playing, and I'm sure you were there, too, that, playoff game at Sparta mm-hmm. and one of the kids one of the kids on, on his team a kid who didn't play a lot was standing next to me I was taking pictures and he goes hey hey Devin where are you going to college right <laughs> it was like the third quarter and Devin looked at me he's like I'm gonna I'm about to kill you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so but I'm sure That's you funny. know just like we had to ask the question uh top of the show and everything else I mean mm-hmm. does it get annoying and like all right I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you stop asking me um not not really, because I know people are just interested in it. It's a, yeah. it's an interesting topic, so I mean, it's just part of the game, I guess. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. it, no, it's true. It really is, and yeah. and, it, yeah, and you also know the flip side is nobody cares where you're going to college. Uh, you know, see you yeah. at Bergen in September. It's a, mm-hmm. There's a you know, 
different different uh, side to it too. Jimmy, you got another one? I don't want to let him go. Is it, listen, this is the first episode of the new year <laughs> of the Monday Morning Quarterback. We have a marquee guest here. I'm not ready to let him get off the phone. He doesn't have school tomorrow. Jimmy, ask him a question. <laughs> Yeah, my, my last question, Jordan. Obviously, you, we were all at the stadium for those two finals. Uh, when your brother played there, obviously, heartbreaking mm-hmm. losses. What would it, what yeah. would it mean to you to not only win one for you, but bring home the state title for your brother? It would mean the world, to be honest. Um, I don't even know. I would just be <laughs> overcome with complete joy. I'd probably just fall out, <laughs> just lay on the ground. But um, I don't, it would be... Probably one of the best moments of my life if we got that. So, yeah, and it's it's bigger than the Fuller family too because yeah. Northern Valley Old Japan is a, it's a whole for it. Yeah, you know? whole yep. community. Yep. So it is cool. All right, I'm going to ask you one more, and then we will let you out of here. All right. Uh, just give us a quick rundown of how important our own Brandon Gregory has been to your uh, development as an athlete because he always likes to take credit for you. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> he's been amazing. Um, I've known him ever since I can remember, probably around I was like four years old. And I've been running track for him since I was probably like five in the kindergarten. Right. And, uh, I'd say he's a big part of why I'm, uh, I'm a pretty fast guy. So, I mean. Is he the loudest coach you've ever had the opportunity to play for? Not really, to be honest. I mean, he yells when <laughs> he only yells at you when you're far away. So, <laughs> right. But that's it. But when you're one-on-one, he just he just real and just – just talk to you. He's not. He's not really a yeller per se. He just. He just has a, yell, a loud voice when you're when you're running your races. Another ringing endorsement for you, Brandon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. You are yeah, perfect. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great stuff, Jordan. Hey, thanks, man. We appreciate uh, you coming on, and we're excited. You know, up here too. I'm part, of, as you said, the community. I'm a part of that community, so I'm looking forward to this uh, season getting started over here in Northern Valley, Old Japan, and. Sure. We, we wish you the best of luck. Most Thank importantly, you. we wish you good health, and uh, we also wish that you will break the news when you do choose a college right here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. How about well, that? Thank you. Well, that was great stuff there with Jordan Fuller. Uh, way to kick the season off with a bang here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. But not to be outdone as we bring in our resident state of New Jersey high school football expert. He is... He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer those Zaki's. And Pat, I, I thought I thought you were great in those commercials. Pat Rice, thanks for joining us here. Yeah, I, I just parallel parked the train. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go now. You were out Friday night, and you three together made one uh, star-studded cast there on the sidelines at uh, Paramus High School opening the season up with a bang. And, uh, listen, it was 14-3, Paramus. I'm following along on Twitter. I couldn't make it over there. Next thing I know, I see 15-14 final. Pat, what happened? Well, Paramus outplayed them for a good part of the game. They beat them up front, uh, especially their defensive line against the Riverdale offensive line. Uh, in the end, Riverdale made a little change, putting the sophomore kid Estevez in, and it, uh, they made the plays that needed to be made in the end. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw it too. They made a long field goal, a good, good, good field goal kicker, and, and that's a uh, you know a, a weapon that can't be underestimated, Jimmy, in the game of high school football. No, it's a, you know, the one thing we talk about is how much kicking has come in the last 20, 25 years. Before, it used to be the old block, straight on linemen kicking field goals. Now you have athletic kickers that are just doing doing crazy, crazy things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it does. It's taken on the, a dimension of college and and pro football. I mean, you know that the forty yarders are not out of the question anymore in high school. You, coaches wouldn't even think about it in the nineties and and before that. So uh, it's crazy. What was the atmosphere like, Brandon? Uh, you know, it was nuts. I think there was a big crowd there, and you know, I think everybody in North Jersey was happy to see football back. Yeah, you know, the crowd there Friday night was really good. When I came and parked my car, there was no parking. I uh, had to park on the grass. Um, long lines getting in. I was able to get in quickly, and um, it was a very it was it was a good way to spend Friday night. Fifteen or fourteen, like uh, Pat and Jimmy mentioned, um, Riverdale came back. Uh, they made some adjustments. Uh, Paramus did outplay them, and um, they had a couple plays that uh, that stood out to me. Derek De La Cruz, this this being his senior year, 
Uh, he played very well for Paramus. And also number 77, like uh, uh, Pat had mentioned on the uh, defensive line, Phil Tellerico. He played extremely well. And like the other person that he mentioned uh, on the Riverdale side, David Estevez, at quarterback, very athletic sophomore. And he was really the key ball player in the course of that game because uh, – Dylan Connolly, uh, Riverdale's returning quarterback, didn't play as well. Uh, from what I was told, there was a couple of preseason injuries, though. So DJ was able to put in a sophomore quarterback. So now they have uh, two pretty good running quarterbacks who will be able to operate Riverdale's offense during the course of the year. Jimmy, from the other side, the Paramus side, I mean, a lot of new faces over there. Uh, Dan Sabella has done such a great job, and that group that walked out the door in June – was God bless you, Pat. Yeah, well, I, there uh, might be a few more. I got allergies right now. <laughs> All right, well, turn away from the phone. Yeah, time. I did. I, uh, I covered it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. So you know, Jimmy, Danny's done such a great job with Paramus, and you know, they had that core group of kids that graduated in June, and it's a different look right. over there. Listen, we know Riverdale's going to be good, and I, I think Paramus, before it's all said and done, they're going to be dangerous as well. Hey, you mentioned that outstanding senior class, most of them three-year starters for Coach Sabella. They went to the two state finals. Uh, he's, he's in rebuilding mode. We were at the Old Japan game scrimmage. Not that game scrimmages always are an indication, but they did not play very well. You expect a, an experienced Riverdale team to go in there and get the job done. And I'll tell you what, the magic man, Danny Sabella, almost pulled almost yep. pulled another one off. They were You know, Danny too how many times have we said, Oh, he's gonna take the job somewhere else, huh? name the parochial, name the group four school, name everything else. He just goes about his business over there, perhaps. Just just a great job. I was talking to the athletic director Don Wall, you know, when they went up fourteen to three, I I think he was in a little bit of amazement at what was going on and I said the two attributes of a great coach is that the kids believe what you preach and that they play hard every single time you see them on the field, and, and that is certainly Paramus. They shut down Riverdale's uh, running game that year, and if it wasn't for an athletic, almost a broken play, a scramble for a touchdown, Paramus would be 1-0. Yeah, that's yeah, true, and that's, uh, you know, as we saw – transitioning a little bit here as we saw you know, one play here or there makes a huge difference that was certainly the case at Pascag Valley against Hackensack it was uh you know a couple of plays here and there a couple of marks of the ball literally a couple of inches either way and the outcome of that game could have been different too I was there with you Jimmy uh, you know Pascag Valley again, oh. another team that's lost some quality seniors <laughs> Pat, <laughs> Pat Rice over there what? honk honk yeah <laughs> yeah you're great. You're the best. Are you all right? Should we say? Yeah, no, I, I, I say it a few times. I just extended the phone as far as away as I could and covered it. Did you blow your nose? I think I heard you blow your yeah, nose. Yeah, I did. Too. My eye is itchy. <laughs> Here's Pat Rice here. <laughs> so, Jimmy, you know, at Pascag Valley, it was a play here, a play there. Uh, you know, Pascag Valley lost some people from back to back state championship teams, and then all they do is go into on the road in a game they took late at Hackensack. Hackensack is going to be good this season, and they come out of there 34-29 on the plus side. That was pretty good. Yeah, it was an outstanding game. You know, we, we took the path less traveled. I know a lot of people, including Pat, were at St. Joe's and uh, Don Bosco, but we felt this was going to be a great game, a game that as of two weeks ago wasn't even set up. And I'll tell you what, an outstanding game, a play here or there, a mistake here or there. I know Coach Wimberly was was a little disappointed in a couple of the, the, the measurements that did not go his way. But you have to give credit to Pascag Valley, who takes, you know, holds on fourth down and then proceeds to go 70 yards for the winning score. And the one thing that was interesting was one of the assistant coaches for Pascag Valley said, this is a program, and this is yeah. what happens with a program that the next person steps up. And they certainly did. For Hackensack, you had to be impressed with their quarterback, the Paramus Catholic transfer. Uh, Drake did an outstanding job throwing the ball. And if they can continue to do that week in and week out, Hackensack becomes a big-time challenger for that North 1 Group 5 title. Absolutely. And the guy in charge of that program, as you mentioned over there at Pascac Valley, is Craig Nielsen. I caught up with him after the game, and here's what he had to say. 
Special teams kept you in early, keep this case through late, uh, made some plays in the passing game. You know, so you got a lot to work on, but you also showed some, a little bit in every case. Well, what I'm happy about is we resilient to the kids. I mean, it was, we did everything we could to give it away, and we did everything we could to get it back. So, I mean, it's a group effort all the way. Great, great How nice is to have an experienced quarterback down there? Well, well, that's that's right. Right. I'm not having that one throw, but other than that, <laughs> this guy was under pressure. Yeah, I know. Uh, you took this game late. I don't know how much you got to do scouting on Hackett. Well, we, would, we, would, we wouldn't have been prepared as well as we were, but would have been for the same amount of players. We were two weeks to get ready for them. And, but, you know, they're in the same boat. So it is season as far as that goes. I, I thought, you know, we had a pretty good read on what they were doing. We, we missed tackles. Uh, you know, we made some mistakes. It's first game. We were physical. That's what I was happy about. I mean, we go from there. A lot of new faces around here. How important for them to get tested? You know, zero weeks, not even week zero. one. Zero <laughs> <That's what you're laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. We don't play. Like I said, I'll play in the post. Yeah. The other thing is not, it's not a level playing field. But public school will play in the It was a great game. A great, great, I thought it was a great game for both yeah, and just to set up the stretch there, uh, Jordan Hunter, 54-yard interception return for a touchdown to put Hackensack up 29-28, and a great uh, call by Benji Wimberly, too. It was 28-21 when Hunter returned the kick and uh, returned an interception. That was the one throw that Craig Nielsen was not happy about that he mentioned in that interview. Uh, Benji Wimberly lines his team up in the extra point. They were making their extra points all day, so you thought they'd go for the tie there. Uh, and then Justin Marin. The holder takes the ball, runs around right end for the two-point conversion that puts him up 29-28. And then Brandon, uh, you saw what Pascal Valley was able to do down the stretch with a three-year starter, Colin Dietrich, at quarterback. A uh, three-year starter, a senior, and also a two-time yeah, state champion. Know, Col- so having a kid with that type of experience helps in those situations. Yes, uh, Colin actually let the uh, let Pascal Valley down with a nice drive to finish off the game. There was a couple, you know, like was mentioned earlier, there was a – uh, close fourth down and one that Hackensack went for. They didn't get the call, turned it over. Uh, uh, Dietrich led uh, Pascac Valley back down the field and um, led them to a, to the 34-29 win. But the player, like Jimmy had mentioned, that that most impressed me, and he didn't manage the game, but he actually and he actually ran their offense very well. And he will be a, a, a hopefully will be a big player moving forward this year. Was Bryce Drayford, uh, the quarterback at Hackensack? He did a very very good job of running their offense and controlling things. He read the he read the he ran the read option very well and passed the ball better than I anticipated during uh, this early part of the year. So Hackensack is really in a good place. Like Benji said, there's no place like there's nothing with moral moral victories. But uh, other than that, Hackensack and Pasadena Valley was a good uh, opening public school game. Um, Pat, Jimmy, and Corey. Yeah, and I'll just pick it up quickly because we're talking about some specifics in the game. And Hackensack, with the lead, the 29-28 lead, got the ball back uh, third and 15 from their own 18, and Drakeford hit. Joshua Marte for a 31-yard gainer up the left side, which you thought that that was going to be the play for a big first down that kind of kept the clock moving, was going to at least make Pascag Valley burn all the timeouts. Then they have a fourth and one on the 43 of Pascag Valley, uh, and that is where they gave the ball to Sandy Almonte, six foot one, 225-pound bruiser who scored two touchdowns in the first uh, quarter. You can't fault the play call or anything else, and that was where he was stopped. And where the, uh, you know, I talked to Benji Wimberley after the game, not going to play his comments here. Uh, but he, you know, that those that was the play that he mentioned as one that if it had gone Hackensack way, Hackensack's way would have changed things. As it was, they came about a half a link short. Then Dietrich leads him down the field. He completes two passes in a row. Uh, then a, another big one on a second and ten. And then he hit Mike Pimpinella for the 16-yard slant. That gave him the winning score. So, uh, you know, I, here, let me play one from uh, – and then Joe Williams had a big sack on the final play of the game that ended it. But I want to play Colin Dietrich's uh, interview real quick, uh, and then we'll move on. We'll bring Pat Rice further in here as we talk about Don Bosco and St. Joe's. Yeah. But here's, uh, here's Colin Dietrich. To talk about the play specifically, was that what was called in the way it was supposed to go, or did you uh, – Yeah. Exactly? I mean, that was a play, but Mike stole, Mike stole his route really well, took his time with it, and once he – Inside, there's an elk space, nobody around them. He's walking to the end zone. It seems to, you know, get tested in not even week one, week zero. Yeah, yeah. Come out with a win and then, you know, some confidence and experience going into my play. Exactly. It's huge because, I mean, we've got a lot of kids who stepped up today. A lot of younger kids who stepped up today. But then you get this experience in a big man around the team and everything. 
be able to come from behind, get that victory at the end. It's huge. We're going to next week and for the season, especially come like playoff time around then. That's when we're going to need this experience to really, you know, camp up and kick in. To be a one-time defending champ last year was, you know, uh, a challenge. Now again, two-time defending champ. Here, does it feel different? Uh, you know, you got to expect best effort today. Yeah, we're going to that's the thing. Every time we step on the field, we're getting the other team's best effort. No doubt about that, because they know what, we, what we've done in our success, and they want us. Everybody wants to get a piece of us, and if you get a piece of us, then, you know, you look like a great team. So it's maybe everybody's best to really happy today. So, you yeah. know, you to go out there and win. Yep, tested in, in zero week. Pasco Valley comes out with a win, and now they will turn around and turn their attention to Montclair, which is a marquee game next weekend. All right, Pat, set the scene for us. You were up there at the big parochial battle, the non-publics. Uh, Joe's and Bosco. Well, Bosco came out strong on their drive. Nice mix of passes and uh, runs, and they scored right away with a six-yard run, where uh, Devito, the quarterback, uh, evaded the rush and just went through the middle and uh, scored a six-yard run. And they uh, they got the ball back eventually, and they bridged the first and second quarter. They had a five-minute drive to open the game, and then. Uh, or, yeah, they, they were the second that the uh, Joes had the uh, ball first. But uh, they bridged the second quarter uh, and the first quarter. It was about another well, six-minute drive or so. And didn't get anywhere with it. Uh, I think that eventually they uh, drove again but missed a field goal. So it was 7 nothing at the half. Uh, Joes made it count because uh, – I think Bosco eventually punted on their first drive of the second half. Joe's came down the field, and a sophomore quarterback, uh, what's his name, and Nick Patty, Nick, Nick, threw a Nick, nice Nick touchdown Patty. pass to Carfagno, the tight end, and it was they missed the extra point, so it was 7-6. They, Bosco got the ball back. Uh, JT Giles Harris uh, picked off the pass, went 69 yards down the uh, opposite sideline. Uh, for the score, they went for two, made it. It was uh, 14-7. And then, uh, Miss, oh, uh, then Bosco, or uh, Joe's intercepted again and returned it, and they wound up getting a field goal out of it. Uh, that was 17-7 with three minutes it. to go. It's a very quickly, quick moving game. Once I was shown up my interview, got to my car, it was like 25-4. Uh, to 4. So it's a quick game. Yeah. And uh, hey. my my drawback yeah, on Nick. my uh, take on that shows is good. Uh, the, the kid's going to be a good quarterback, Patty. Uh, I interviewed him, and he even said, uh, once I settled down, uh, I did very well. I think he was four for four in the second half. Hold on, Pat. We, you mentioned your interview, and Brian Carr oh, taped yeah. it. He sent it to us. So let's hear your interview with Nick Patty after the game. Once you got past halftime, I felt more comfortable, I guess. Mm-hmm. And having that good drive down the field got, really got me going. And then seeing JP run 60 yards down the field got me excited, too. Yeah, and then the drive got going, you, you were comfortable. Yeah. Well, I feel like once Mikey caught it in the end zone. Oh, I, yeah, that was I, a good one. He was covered, too. Yeah, I, I saw Tyrone was facing towards him. And I saw Mikey was looking right at me, and I knew right there he wouldn't have enough time to turn around and get it. Yeah. But yeah, he didn't turn around the corner, right? Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Harris, number seven, TD. Okay. Uh, but how does it feel first first game as a starter, sophomore year? I mean, and I feel like any time you beat Bosco, it's going to be a great feeling. But for this would be my first one and get the opportunity to play them. Mm-hmm. And my first game, it's a great feeling. Jimmy, not bad. First time out. Fans going nuts in Montvale, home game, beat Bosco. Not a bad win. Yeah, well, the, you know, like I said, once he settled down, he did well. Uh, and Joe's offensive line uh, did a good job. And the defensive line could have did a good job on Bosco's offensive line. And for Bosco, on a plus side, this kid Hunter, oh, is it Hunter Reynolds or whatever his name is, number nine. But eight, eight passes. Brandon Gregory eight is a resident passes name. For, uh, over 100 yards, seven of them were first downs. One was uh, for nine yards to give them third and one, which uh, they eventually got the first down. And aside from the two interceptions, uh, DeVito was actually pretty good, I thought. He wasn't fabulous, but he was good. I mean, for both of them, it was their first game. Yeah. 
you know, I, I ha- we had some uh, sound hey, of hey, Augie Hoffman. Just, hey, we had just one thing uh, uh, here, because uh, my dinner is getting cold. I'm at a restaurant yeah. outside here. So I'd like to get this wrapped right, up. So, Pat, we, we... – yeah. All right, we'll okay. let you go then. How about that? We appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate you dropping by here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. And the last thing we want to do is have you yeah. with a cold dinner. So, okay, take thanks care. for checking in. Okay, thanks. We'll catch up Bye-bye. again. All right, thanks, Pat. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, uh, Jimmy, the interesting thing is, and, and not to make excuses because I know Don Bosco certainly would, but it seemed like they came out very, very strong in the first half and seemed to take steps back in the second half. I know they did not have a game scrimmage. I know the team that they were supposed to play backed out late. And you kind of wonder if that not being in game shape, game condition, the week before the first game hurt them in the second half. Not to take anything away from St. Joe's. Obviously, they're coached very well. But the interesting thing this year, guys, is they might meet again in the in the group four parochial. Joe's moved up. So it's not like it's been the last 15 years where you get one shot at each other. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting uh, about the situation, too, is that, like as I was mentioning before, uh, Pat (laughs) had to uh, take a bite of his cold pizza. But I had some sound with Augie Hoffman. I I don't want to run it because the the sound quality is not that great and there's a lot of background noise. But what he was saying, he was making the case that St. Joe's is the, you know, since the Big North United has been formed – they're the they have the best record overall. So he was you know he made that case. His team beats Bosco on week one, but there's such a long way to go in this division that you know I don't I don't think nothing's settled yet because Joe's could lose, Bosco could win out. Uh, Paramus Catholic did not lose in the division. Bergen Catholic's going to be a player here, so it's really only you know strike one. There's strikes two well, and three. There's no, to come, you know, there's no right? question. I think there's a. Hold on, I think I think we lost you there for a second. Let me uh, back that up. You know, you kind of right, you kind of worry the last couple of nights before the first game because you think you know what you are as a team, but you never really know till that first game is played. And to to have those guys play, move it up from Thanksgiving to the first game, I give them both credit uh, playing that game. And uh, you know, it'll ultimately make both teams better. Brando, a lot of football left to be played, not just in that league, but uh, all across Most definitely, you North know, Jersey. like Jimmy said, you know, Bosco not being able to scrimmage, that's kind of not helpful because, you know, Toll and the rest of the staff weren't able to really see what they were going to be able to do against another opponent. You know, regard, you know, so have a, so to start off your season only with a real game, it kind of put them behind the eight ball. You may have had a, an idea. And that's where scrimmages can kind of clarify things. But now with a live game, they're, you know, they're like, unfortunately, you know, you can't make, you can't make the adjustments until this upcoming week, uh, week number one. And then also the, the other thing that Jimmy said in reference to knowing what your team is, is going to be interesting how Paramus Catholic bounces back this week after their first, uh, after their first loss because they were a prohibitive favorite to win that game. So we're going to see how Westervelt builds that program following what Chris Partridge did because, you know, to start off the season with a loss is always interesting how you come back the following week moving forward, uh, Corey and Jimmy. <clears throat> Absolutely, and it, it, that's something that we didn't even mention, is that it was the first game for Coach Westervelt over there, too, uh, at Paramus Catholic. So you got to give him a little bit of time. I and mean, he wasn't even expecting to have this job uh, a month or two ago. So, you know, you got to give him a little chance to get his feet wet as well. All right, last thing, that's the game stuff we're going to talk about uh, this week. We'll have plenty more coming at you next week as we also get our feet set in this new season. But, uh, Jimmy, I just want to talk to you and Brandon a little bit about the state of high school football. You know, we did a lot of it on the sidelines at Pascag Valley, and a couple of thoughts that came to my mind. I mean, the parochial powers have, you know, vacuumed up a lot of the talent around here. That's why it's so refreshing to have a kid like Jordan Fuller on. Uh, I don't know how many public school kids of his cal- or how many kids of his caliber are running around in public schools in New Jersey. It's great to see, uh, and you heard the kid speaking firsthand of just, you know, he's got his head screwed on straight. It's it's good to hear. But, you know, a little state of the state on New Jersey football right now. I think it was great to see Pascac Valley and Hackensack 
play that kind of game as two public school teams willing to take a game on short notice to play each other. And as the talent migrates, certainly to the parochials, what's left is maybe not as good a level of football, but certainly as good competitively. And for me, and as you said earlier, we had a great time watching that game. So, you know, it, maybe it's not as – it's maybe a silver lining in all this madness that is uh, parochial well, there's football no, nowadays. There's no question. You know, we, we talked about it a lot. I mean, we seem to have all the answers. But, uh, you know, the, my, my feeling is good football is good football. Bad football is bad football. There are a lot of parochial games. You're standing there in the second corner and it's 35 nothing, and you're saying, hey, what, what – why did I come to this game? So, you know, you give credit to these right. teams that are willing to go out, put it on the line week one, because, you know, the old mindset is, hey, let's protect our record. Let's be undefeated. You know, we jokingly, you know, bus coach Johnson a couple of years ago when he had that, that easy schedule when he was blowing people out. But you know what? That does not make you better. You know, the ultimate goal is to right. win a state championship. Who cares if you're seven and four? Or if you're 11 and 0, the ultimate goal is the state championship. And when you play these type of games, like we saw in Hackensack, like we will see with Pascac Valley and Montclair next week, that makes you better. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Brandon, how about you? I mean, you know what? It's funny, too, the evolution of the three of us when the show started three years ago. You know, Brandon, we had the conversation. You wanted to get down to see Bergen Catholic. And I'm not saying we're not going to cover the parochials this year because we will do it. I mean, we'll be in Giant Stadium and we'll see him uh, certainly down the road. But, uh, you know, the, the public school football is fun. Hey, here's a bunch of kids who grew up together going out and playing the game. Let's you know, go watch it. Having the opportunity this weekend, like I said, to see Riverdale, Paramus, Pascac Valley, and Hackensack. That, those were two very good games. I was very impressed. And like Jimmy said, you only get better by playing good competition. You don't get better by playing uh, inferior competition because when the coach is going to the, uh, into the film room, they can actually give a good critique of where the ball players are at. So when you do play high quality competition, that's what you want to be able to do because then you do get the player and you do get the player's attention a lot more that way because you say, well, hey, we played a good team. So what I'm saying to you is something that you should pay attention to, to as far as getting better with the details, with understanding how to block the schemes, um, the scheme coverages, and running the ball, and running the uh, and getting better at, at on the offensive side of the ball, the defensive side of the ball, and most importantly, that was things that we never mentioned that we don't really talk about too much, is special teams because that field goal actually yep. was the difference in the Riverdale game when he kicked, uh, kicked the field goal, Jimmy. So uh, right. special teams is just as important as the offense and the defense. No doubt. And uh, Joe Colasano's uh, 89-yard kickoff return for a touchdown for Pascal Valley also Definitely. played a big part in that game as well, too. So, yeah, good stuff. Boys, I'm glad we are back here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. A new season is upon us. We'll have plenty of more issues, plenty of more games, lots of things to talk about, lots of guests to get on here. But I think uh, out of the box here, we had a, a primetime guest. We had Pat Rice blowing his nose and then blowing us off. So we had a little bit of everything here. Week one on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Follow the leader.